गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑफ यू जस्ट सो टुडे दिस सेमिनार इज अबाउट यूरिनरी ट्रैक्ट इन्फेक्शन एंड इट्स मैनेजमेंट इनिशियली आई विल डील विथ सम drugs or medicines that are used as urinary antiseptics most of the antibiotics to be used in urinary tract infections have been covered in previous lectures like your beta lactam antibiotics those includes your penicillin group of antibiotics then cephalosporins then other cell wall acting cell wall synthesis inhibitor antibiotics like your phospomycin colistrin bacitracin these have been covered okay carbapenem Imipenem, meropenem, meropenem, ertapenem. These have been covered. I think uh, cotrimoxazole is coming under sulfonamide antibiotics. Uh, sulfonamide chapter has been covered, I think, but quinolone chapter is not covered. Okay, so it will be covered later on. So initially, uh, there are when there is some dysuria or urgency or increase in frequency. of urination these are initial signs symptoms of any urinary tract infections maybe it is in male or it is in females urinary tract infection is most commonly seen in case of females though jab uh, uh it may be associated with pregnant women or non pregnant women also but basically it is uh, more common in case of females as compared to males and this can be classified into complicated types or uncomplicated types most of the times there is asymptomatic cases it is called as asymptomatic bacteriuria means there will be no signs symptoms but still the patient or subject will have significant bacterial load in its urines bacterial load in urine means there is some bacterial infection inside its urinary tract the urinary tract can be lower urinary tract that is bladder or urethra or it can be in upper urinary tract that is the ureter or kidneys so it can yes so is the problem ppt is not changing like we are stuck on first yeah, slide I'll, 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 yeah i i i know it i'll change it when required i am just telling you the initial introduction part so it can be upper respiratory uh, upper urinary tract infections that can be called as pyelonephritis or it can be lower urinary tract infections basically called as cystitis or it can be infection of urethra also okay so in most of the asymptomatic cases the urine if it is cultured and the bacterial load is found more than 10 to the power 5 back colony forming units then it is called as is yes, there is significant bacteria 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 is there though the patient is asymptomatic also remember it is it more than 10 to the power 5 colony forming in it okay if the patient is catheterized and still there is some bacteria is there means there will be more 10 to the power more than 10 to the power 2 colony forming units are there then that is also called as asymptomatic bacteria if the symptom is there means fever will be there or dysuria is there urgency frequency will be there then that is called as symptomatic urinary tract infections and the most common organism is e coli or gram negative organisms e coli klebsiella pseudomonas also some gram positive organisms like your staph aureus are also responsible for these infections so the initial thing is to be used is some called as urinary antiseptics why it is called as urinary antiseptics let's see the slides the antiseptic is an agent used to inhibit the bacterial growth in in vitro or in vivo there is three things one is antiseptic other is disinfectant other is sterilizing agents you have to know the difference between these three first and now and you are using sanitizers okay sanitizers are one type of antiseptics 
because you are applying it over this living surface or on your skins. Okay. So antiseptics are something which are used to inhibit the bacterial growth and these are applied on the living surface. Disinfectants are also used to, to kill the microorganisms. So these are used on non-living environment. Or you can use upon the uh, tabletop, or you can use upon the instruments which are you are going to use in operation theatres. Okay, these are called disinfectants. Uh, something called as sterilizing agents. These antiseptic and disinfectants they inhibit the bacterial growth. Means they are acting upon the vegetative organisms. They are most of the time they are not. 100% efficacious, and most of the time they are not acting upon the spores. Okay, spores are not vegetative types. So bacteria may have vegetative form or spore, spore form, spore forms, form, forms. So if the agent is also acting upon the spores or it is having additional sporicidal effect, then you can call it as sterilizing agents. Okay. So coming to urinary antiseptics. Some antimicrobial agents are given orally. Okay, they can be given orally, but they attain antibacterial concentrations only in the urine. Though you are giving it orally, so we think that there will be some systemic concentrations or blood concentration will be sufficient to attain its bacterial inhibitory capacity. But no, the blood concentration is not sufficient to have its antibacterial property. That's why it has little or no systemic antibacterial property, but it attains the concentration inside the urine, which is sufficient for its antibacterial actions. That means it is actively secreted or some passive diffusion inside the urinary tract is there. In the urines, in, inside the bladder, it will, its concentration will be high so that it can act locally. And most of the times, these are applied for lower urinary tract infections, means for the cystitis types. It is not applicable for the upper urinary tract infections. Okay. So like many other drugs, they are concentrated in the kidney tubules and are useful mainly in the lower urinary tract infections. They have been called urinary antiseptics because this may be considered as a form of local therapy. Why you are Called as, calling it as antiseptics because they are active at a particular local sites. Just like you are applying sanitizers or antiseptic on a particular local skin. Like this, these are active inside the cystis or the, inside the bladder or urethra. That's why they have local actions, so you are calling it as urinary antiseptics. Some examples are nitrofurantoins, methanamines, nalidic acids. So these are some drugs, okay. So we'll deal with some one by one drugs. Uh, I've already discussed about these things. So e. coli is the most common pathogen. Uh, even Staphylococcus or Saprophyticus can be the most common bacterial pathogen causing UTIs. In addition to these urinary antiseptics, you can use Cotrimoxazole and Quinolones. Uh, they are not responding. Okay, these antiseptic are not responding, then you can go for other antibiotics which are acting systemically, like quotrimoxazole or quinolones. So, I think I've discussed these things. So, coming to nitrofurantoin. So, this is the drug which is active against many urinary tract pathogens, but not against proteus or pseudomonas. Okay. And the thing is that single daily doses of the drug can prevent recurrent urinary tract infections. And acidification of the urine enhances its activity. See, uh, there are some organisms which, which can cause acidification of the urine. Some organisms are there, they can cause alkalinization of the urines. Accordingly, some drugs are active in acidic mediums, some drugs are active in the basic mediums. Okay. Like, there are some antibiotics like your nitrofurantoin, tetracyclines, or some cephalosporin group of antibiotics like your cephotaxins. These are active in case of your acidic medium drugs. Okay. If the pH is less than 7 or towards 5, they are more active. Okay. There are some drugs like your fluoroquinolones, macrolides, okay, quotrimoxazole, trimethoprins, and most of the cephalosporins. 
including aminoglycosides. These are active when the medium is alkaline. Okay, that's why whenever it, uh, this type of drugs is prescribed, fluoroquinolones or this type of drugs is prescribed in case of UTI, simultaneously alkasol is also prescribed. Why? You have to take alkasol one uh, five ml in a half glass of water, and you have to take along with this antibiotics. Why? It is it will cause alkalinization on the urine, so that these antibiotics will have better actions. And there are some antibiotics which are acting irrespective of the pH, like your colistin, chloramphenicols, amoxicillin club that is amoxicillin plus clavulanic acids and sometimes trimethoprim or sulfamethoxazole or oxacillins. Okay. So this nitroforantoin is a drug which can act better in the acidic mediums. Okay. And the drug is active orally and is excreted in the urine via filtration and excretions. Okay. So it is secreted in the uh, mm, Urinary tract tubules, uh, so is in, in the secret in urinary uh, glomerulus and urinary. Okay, it is secreted in the urines. So that's why some drugs like your proben acid, they can interfere with this nitroforantoin actions. How they will interfere? They will inhibit the secretion of this nitroforantoin inside the luminal tract. Thereby, they will reduce the action of nitroforantoins. Though you know that. Probenecid will increase the action of penicillins by inhibiting its tubular secretions and thereby increasing its blood concentrations. But opposite will action will happen with nitroforantoin because nitroforantoin concentration is needed inside the urine. Okay, so tubular secretion should be more for its effective actions, and probenecid inhibits its action. So it is a interaction of the probenecids with these drugs. Coming to adverse effects, it has GI irritation, skin rashes, phototoxicity, sometimes neuropathies can occur with these drugs, and it is contraindicated in case of patients with GCHPD deficiencies. Okay. So this is about your nitroforantoin group of drugs, and it is commonly used in case of uncomplicated urinary tract infection, that too in lower urinary tract infections. Okay. Coming to next group, that is methanamine. It is uh, a methanamine mandalate or methanamine hippurate combination. Urine acidification is required for this. In acidic medium, it is better acti active. And these drugs are not usually active against proteus and uh, because proteus causes alkalinization of the urine. And this is a drug which is active in acidic medium. So for proteus, it is not active. Coming to insoluble, com it's, this methanamine, it forms insoluble complexes and the ultimate active metabolite is, is formaldehyde, means methanamine is converted to formaldehyde. Formaldehyde exerts its antibacterial actions. The thing is that formaldehyde is too much toxic, so methanamine is not used significantly nowadays because it, is, it has very much uh, serious toxicities. Though it can be used in urinary antiseptic if other drugs are not effective. Okay. And uh, coming to the next drug that is nalidexic acid, it is called as prototype of the fluoroquinolones. Okay. It is a fluoroquinolone group of drugs. It is a prototype of these drugs. And this drug acts against many gram negative organisms, but not against proteus and pseudomonas. The mechanism is by DNA guided inhibitions. This drug is active orally and is excreted in urine partly on chest and partly as inactive glucuronides. And its toxic effect includes the fluoroquinolone like toxic effects like GI irritations will be there, skin rashes, autotoxicity will be there, and visual disturbances and CNS stimulation. Sometimes it can cause seizures also. It can precipitate seizures also. Okay. And nitroforantoin may antagonize the action of nalidixic acid. So both the drugs cannot be used simultaneously. Okay. And I have told you it is the 
prototype of first member of fluoroquinolones and uh, its spectrum is wide spectrum somewhat because it is a fluoroquinolone group of drugs the concentration of free drug in plasma and most usage is non therapeutic for systemic infections but its concentration attained in the urine and gut lumen are significant for antibacterial actions that's why it is commonly used in case of urinary infections and diarrhea caused by e coli organisms so this is about some drugs these are called urinary antiseptics apart from urinary antiseptics if these are not effective then you, you will switch over to some antibiotic drugs like your cephalosporins cotrimoxazole group of drugs phospomycins okay or your beta lactam drugs like amoxicillin clavulanic acids or cephalosporins okay so um i think uh, dr arun will take over now and he will classify the types of uti that is complicated and non complicated types and uh, what is the line of management in these cases one thing i have to just just tell you that some drugs uh, are to be specifically used in case of pregnant women because pregnant women it is told that no drug is to be used unless it is seriously indicated and among this urinary antiseptics or antibiotics which drug are to be safely used in case of pregnancy these are only like your amoxicillin group of drugs okay or nitrofurantoin drugs or if it is serious then you can use cotrimoxazole but mind it that cotrimoxazole should not be used in case of third trimester of pregnancy okay so nitrofurantoin among this uh, your uh, urinary antiseptics amoxicillin or this type of beta lactam drugs can be used safely in case of pregnancy and if it is required you can use cotrimoxazole okay so this is about uh, something about urinary antiseptics i think dr uh, arun will take over now and he will discuss something about this more line of management uh, mr tiwari yes sir tiwari ji sir aap chodo aap pehle aap leave karo आप लीव करो सर क्या बोल रहे हैं आप छोड़ दो आप आप छोड़ दो आप दोबारा जुड़ जाना ठीक है ठीक है ठीक है सर ठीक है सर हेलो सर कैन यू हेयर मी हेलो हाँ हाँ सर मैं अभी आपकी साउंड आ रही है सर अपनी स्लाइड शेयर करो सर ठीक है सर फुल स्क्रीन ठीक है सर अ वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑनर्ड ऑल आई होप आई एम ऑडिबल क्लियरली Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fine. Uh, so, uh, I guess that you would have had a good overview about what are the urinary antiseptics, about the various antibiotics which are in general used. So, I will try to deal on only the clinical aspects of urinary tract infection. Per se. So, yeah. So, for understanding about how the urinary tract infection is to be managed, we first need to understand. how urinary tract infection presents in patients one how is it different between males and females what is complicated and what is uncomplicated there are multiple terminologies it should be going through first of all what we should remember would be that the urinary tract in males and females is different as you can see the urinary tract consists of the kidneys which are quite which are same in both male and female gender you have the ureters which empty into the bladder and from the bladder you have the urethra through which there is a exterior opening so this is where the male and the female uh, gender differs the urethra in males it passes from the bladder it has a prostatic part which passes through the prostate and then a membranous part before it in, in, uh, it enters the penis and then a penile part through which the uh, through which it is connected to the exterior whereas in the females it directly exits from the bladder into the uh, vaginal orifice because of this the urethral uh, length 
is only around around 2 inches or 4 centimeters in females whereas it is around 20 centimeters or 8 inches in males so because of this difference it is obvious that the urethra is shorter in females and this causes the increased risk of uti in females. that is why females are more commonly exposed to uti there are some other factors which should be seen but from an anatomical aspect this is how a male and a female urinary tract are different so what is a uta so obviously it is the presence of a pathogen that means a microorganism in the urinary system right from the urethra up to the kidneys with the presence of either symptoms or at any inflammatory response of the pathogen which requires therapy this is what is a urinary tract infection it can involve either the lower urinary tract or the upper urinary tract and it can present as either an asymptomatic infection or a overtly symptomatic infection so very severe cases where it enters the blood stream where the microorganism enters the blood stream thereby causing sepsis and a uh, critical illness so you have a varied presentation of urinary tract infection so how common is a urinary tract infection so uh, what we are seeing would be a, a global data where it was seen that community acquired uti it is common in around 0.7% of the population and you, uh, the w world health organization says that around 150 million people get affected with a urinary uh, tract infection globally and among those who are admitted in the hospital catheter associated urinary tract infection that is uti which happens in those with the indwelling urinary catheter is the most common healthcare infection and around 1 to 2 percent of all patients even if they are ambulatory they develop urinary tract infection even if the catheter is inserted only once and those who are having catheter for more than a week or so the urinary tract infection is common in nearly one fourth of these patients this just shows how common the urinary tract infection is globally with regard to india per se uh, it is commonly seen in around 33 percent of the one third of the patients are uh, known to develop uti and uh, among pregnant females three percent develop uti of which one third around one percent totally they have asymptomatic bacteria among catheterized patients here again nearly one third of the patients develop uti and overall this is more common in the female age group and uh, nearly 40 to 50 percent of women in the reproductive age group they tend to have at least one episode of uti in their lifetime so UTI is common even in India. That is what we like to tell. With regard to the classification, we will have to understand how the urinary tract is. We divide it into a lower tract urinary tract infection and upper tract one. Upper tract one is where the kidneys are affected. That is, you are going to have pyelonephritis. That is, inflammation of the kidneys. Whereas, lower urinary tract infections are the ones where the bladder is involved or the urethra is involved. That is, either a cystitis or a urethritis that becomes a lower urinary tract urinary tract infection another classification of uti would be as to whether they are complicated or uncomplicated so uh, what are uncomplicated utis because apart from all these all are complicated so um, uncomplicated uti means it can either be an upper urinary tract or lower urinary tract uti that is patient can have either a cystitis or a pyelonephritis both can be uncomplicated if it happens in a non-pregnant outpatient women. That means if the, if the uh, female patient is going to be pregnant, it becomes complicated. If the female patient needs admission, it becomes uh, complicated. If they are being treated on an outpatient basis and the female patient is not pregnant, then it is uncomplicated. And here, women is important. This is because if a male develops a UTA, it is considered a complicated UTA without anatomic abnormalities or instrumentation. So if at all the patient has any anatomic issues, he has a stricture, a narrowing of the urethra, he has some surgery which has happened in the urinary tract, then it becomes complicated. If the patient has a catheter, instrumentation has happened, or he has a percutaneous nephrostomy tube, then it becomes a complicated UTA. Apart from this, if a non-pregnant woman develops a UTA, it is an uncomplicated urinary tract infection. So this just shows the varied types of manifestations of UTA per se. So complicated UTA is one where there is uh, cystitis, a catheter is involved, it happens in male, 
the receptors, they are very high risk. Whereas the low risk UTIs are the asymptomatic bacteria, pyelonephritis or cystitis, which happens in a female patient. However, you should remember that anytime, even an uncomplicated urinary tract infection can become a serious one and can lead to sepsis, where it becomes a high risk or a complicated UTI. So, this for us to understand the various terminologies per se. So, if you are going to have a presence of bacteria in a clean catch urinary sample in a patient who does not have any symptoms, then we call it asymptomatic bacteria. So, there are no symptoms, but there is bacteria which is present in the uh, urinary examination. So, this becomes asymptomatic bacteria. If the patient has symptoms and has a culture positivity of a bacteria with 10 power 5 colony forming units, then we call it as a symptomatic urinary tract infection. So this is one classification based upon symptoms as asymptomatic or symptomatic. The other classification would be whether it is an uncomplicated or complicated, as we have seen earlier, a female, non pregnant, outpatient without any surgery or instrumentation or catheter becomes uncomplicated. Apart from this, all other cases are complicated. A pregnant UTA is a complicated UTA. And one significant difference would be a renal transplant recipient. Being nephrologists, we are very commonly associated with renal transplants. So a renal transplant individual has an altered uh, morphology, obviously has a newer kidney. This is also is a complicated UTA. Whenever the blood stream has bacteria, because of the UTA, it is called as a urosepsis, which is the most severe form of a urinary tract infection. So these are the various terminologies what we use in UTI person. With regard to the etiology, the most common organism is uh, E. coli. Though we have studies have shown that it is around 75 to 95 percent common, it is around three fourths in around three fourths of all cause of UTA. It is because of E. coli. The other common species include Proteus, Klebsiella various enterococci species, and at times fungal organisms like Candida. With regard to complicated UTIs, based upon the scenarios, it varies. Like in a catheterized individuals, Staphylococcus saprophyticus may be common, especially in those with anatomical abnormalities. In a renal transplant individual, uh, they are more prone for atypical organisms. So it varies according to the underlying cause in a complicated UTI, whereas in uncomplicated E. coli and other enterobacteria are the most common organisms. So this is just something you should have read in microbiology already. Uh, what are the common organisms which cause UTA? It is the same. It is either E. coli, uh, Proteus and Klebsiella. They are common both in uncomplicated and complicated. Whereas catheter associated, what we see usually apart from Proteus is Acinetobacter. Acinetobacter is more common in the hospital settings, especially in those who are catheterized or in prolonged hospital state is more common. And recurrent UTAs can also happen with any of the above organisms. Nothing specific with regard to that. So, why is that everyone does not develop UTA? UTA is not uh, common in the general population. Why is it so? So, there are a number of defense mechanisms which our body has in order to prevent a uh, urinary tract from getting infected. The first one would be that the normal flora, which is present in the periurethral and urethral region, it acts as a barrier against colonization. This consists of various streptococci, lactobacilli, and corneal bacteria. In the females, the presence of estrogen per se, it causes a low vaginal pH, an acidic pH. And apart from this, the cervix has production of local Ig, uh, Ig antibodies. And this prevents colonization in these patients. The urinary flow, where urine is rich in uh, organic acids and pam Horschel protein, in the presence of high osmolality, it prevents the growth of microorganisms. This per se will prevent UTA. And as you go higher up, the bladder, the bladder epithelium, it has a number of tall-like receptors which would be able to recognize all these microorganisms and present it to the immune system, thereby uh, causing a rapid immune response and clearance of the organism. That is how the bladder prevents itself from getting infected. And moreover, if at all it gets infected, there's a rapid exfoliation of the epithelium. Thereby, it prevents infection to set in into the bladder. So based upon these mechanisms, usually the urinary tract is prevented from uh, any infection. So as you can see, 
the urethral cells have a layer of umbrella cells over them so whenever the bacteria gets adhered to it within 6 hours they get exfoliated in most the, in most of the cases where there is a normal immunity and once they get exfoliated the regeneration is completed within a day within 24 hours that is how the integrity of the mucosa is maintained one and two the infection is also prevented from uh, getting more severe so this is what the normal host response happens so when does this get affected whenever the urinary flow is reduced the urinary flow can be reduced when there is any obstruction whether there is a prostate which gets hypertrophied there is a malignancy there whether there is a urethral stricture which is present all these can obstruct the urinary flow thereby reducing the flow and predisposing to infection two when the bladder is having is a neurogenic bladder that means that it is not able to empty itself properly on time then you are going to have residual urine this can cause the bacteria to proliferate or microorganism uh, to proliferate and this is can also happen in patients with voiding dysfunction they won't be able to void the urine properly because of either congenital causes can be either muscular or neurologic in uh, character which is more commonly seen in the pediatric age group this is one cause the second thing would be where the colonization is more uh, is happening more commonly this can happen with recurrent unprotected sexual activity by using spermicides which will increase the binding of the microorganisms to the local epithelium uh, by generalized overt use of antimicrobial agents which is more common in the hospital scenario which will affect apart from the uh, disease causing bac uh, bacteria it is going to affect the normal colonizing bacteria also thereby increasing the risk of uti and also in the post menopausal women where estrogen is depleted thereby it causes uh, increased uh, sorry uh, thereby it causes increased uh, uh, binding of the microorganisms to the mucosa so these are the reasons why this can happen and apart from this uh, if at all the patient has a catheter or has some incontinence or has some residual urine it provides a method by which the urine the microorganisms can ascend up into the upper urinary tract thereby causing uti so these are the risk factors by which patients can develop uti with regard to females whenever how does estrogen have an impact whenever there's a reduction in estrogen which happens in the post menopausal uh, play uh, scenario or when the ovaries have been removed in case of oophorectomies then there is a reduction in the vaginal lactobacilli this in turn reduces the vaginal ph and because the acidic ph is a protective component and when this is lost there will be colonization from the rectum very commonly thereby increasing the preponderance of urinary tract infections so the urinary tract infections can happen from any of the roots one it can be from the lymphatic root two from the hematogenous root that is a patient has a bacteria which is already in the blood stream it can come and get deposited in the kidneys and urinary tract that by causing uk this can also happen but the most common route is ascending route that is from the exterior through the urethra be it in males or females this is the most common route of urinary tract infection so what happens in general is that the bacteria they have a number of adhesions of fimbriae through which it gets uh, adhered to the urothelium either the umbrella cells or through the urothelium through adhesions and when that happens they enter into the urothelial cells uh, in the cyto uh, in the cytosol there is a proliferation there is intracellular proliferation which happens and after some time they form a biofilm by forming a biofilm they tend to get uh, protected from the immune response of the patient and because they are protected they tend to proliferate even further and then they disperse and affect the adjacent cells so this is how bacteria proliferates within the urothelium affects the adjacent cells causing progression of the urinary tract infection and probably sepsis in the long run so uh, this image is uh, probably it's a little busy slide but if you can read it you will be able to understand how there is a progression or complication in uti so initially what you have is a contamination of the periurethral region with regard to a pathogen which is more commonly from the rectal opening especially in females you will have colonization of the urethra and then the microorganisms they then progress on to the bladder once they reach the bladder they elicit a inflammatory response and they tend to invade the bladder by means of the pili and the adhesions which we have seen there will be neutrophil infiltration 
of the bladder mucosa. There will be multiple bacterial proliferation, and the immune system is escaped by means of the biofilm formation. Based upon because of this response, there would be damage to the epithelium by means of bacterial toxins and proteases. And once the bladder is damaged, they can then progress through the ureter to reach the kidneys. Once they reach the kidneys, here again they can colonize the kidneys, damage the host uh, damage, uh, host tissues by means of bacterial toxins again. And here again, from here they can enter into the bloodstream and cause sepsis. This is how a simple UTI can become a complicated UTI, resulting in urosepsis. There is a colonization, urothelial penetration, ascension into the kidneys, resulting in pyelonephritis, and thereby causing renal injury as well as sepsis. This is what which can happen. So, having understood how UTI happens, what is a basic pathogenesis, we'll move on to the routine management. So management per se would consist of diagnosis, either using a prof history, physical examination, urine examination or imaging, and a treatment, which is usually with an antimicrobial agent and with adjunct therapies. So what are the most common symptoms of urinary tract infection? What we know would be either a burning or painful mixturation, an urge to urinate, which is constantly present. And even after voiding, patients would feel that they are not voided completely. The urine can be cloudy or there can be some foul odor to the urine. So these are the most common symptoms. So with regard to the part of the urinary tract involved, this can vary. If at all the urethra is involved, they will have a foul smelling discharge with some burning mixturation, this urea. If the bladder, this bladder muscle is involved, then they will have a painful urination. They will have a lower abnormal discomfort and they will have a constant urge to urinate. This is common in cystitis. When the patient tends to have a pyelonephritis, wherein the kidneys are involved, then they will have flank pain. They will have high-grade fever and systemic features like nausea, vomiting, and all would be present. So this is more common with pyelonephritis. So based upon this, we can come to an idea about which part of the immune tract is involved. So these symptoms can also be seen in patients who are going to have prostatitis, when they're going to have some diverticula in sexually transmitted inf infections and all. And we may have to diagnose UTI by means of a urinary examination in order to confirm it and to rule out these differential diagnoses. So with regard to a physical examination, not much is present physically by examination. Uh, around 10 to 20 percent of the patients, they tend to have some amount of suprapubic tenderness because of involvement of the bladder. So over the pubic rame, a compression would elicit tenderness in these patients. But this is very less, this is really uncommon. For those who are having pyelonephritis, if you're going to palpate, press on the renal angle, which is present between the 12th rib and the spine, the, the erector spinous region, then they may have a tenderness. That is one. And those who have pyelonephritis usually have a toxic look. They have an open eyes, they, have a, they are febrile, they have a good amount of tachycardia because of their high fever. So more common when there is a pyelonephritis or a systemic involvement like urosepsis. So apart from this, the only other means of diagnosing a UTI would be by means using dipsticks, where you're going to use over-the-counter dipsticks, which are available in almost all OPDs and clinics or in the ward directly. A complete urine analysis can be done. And in some cases, you may have to visualize the tract by means of an ultrasound or a CT or you may have to even use a cystoscopy wherein you're going to put, place a tube through the urethra and see the cyst, uh, bladder. That is why it is called a cystoscopy. It may be required in severe cases. So these are the methods by which we are going to diagnose a UTI. So the CDC, Center for Disease Control US, has given the following guidelines or criteria for uh, diagnosing UTI. Uh, for a symptomatic urinary tract infection, Patient can be either symptomatic with acute dysuria or have tenderness of the prostate and other organisms in the presence of a positive urine culture, or they may have a fever, leukocytosis with either costovertebral tenderness or a suprapubic tenderness and a positive urine culture, or they may have only a costovertebral angle tenderness, incontinence, urinary urgency, two of either of these symptoms along with a positive urine culture. So, what is required would be a positive urinary culture 
with around two of the other symptoms should be present for a diagnosis of a symptomatic urinary tract infection. For a catheter associated symptomatic urinary tract infection, they should obviously have a catheter or the catheter should have been removed lesser than two days before. That is in the 48 hours, uh, within the last 48 hours, the catheter has to be removed. Then also it becomes a catheter associated urinary tract infection. So apart from the presence of a catheter, they should have fever, either with or without rigors, systemic features like hypotension, uh, costovertebral tenderness, or any purulent discharge from the catheter site, in addition to a urinary culture positivity, where they can have not more than two microorganisms. Because if at all they're going to have more than two microorganisms, it means it is going to be a contaminated patient. We don't expect multiple microorganisms initially. So up to two is acceptable. And at least one of them should be more than 10 to the power of five colony for means. Then only we can come to a conclusion of a catheter associated UTA. For asymptomatic bacteria, the urinary culture is obviously a plus which should be there with the, press, with the absence of any symptom. Then you can come to a conclusion of an asymptomatic bacteria. So with regard to urine examination, you should advise your patients properly that they should wash their hands, they should clean the periurethral region, pull back the foreskin if at all it is a, a male, and they should collect the urine especially a midstream urine has to be collected. A proper urinary collection is very important for us to ensure the yield is good and we are able to diagnose the UTA properly. So that should be always be ensured. So we are having multiple methods. We can either use a dipstick to diagnose, we can uh, diagnose using urinary microscopy, urine analysis or by culture. So in a dipstick, we are going to measure two things. One is a nitrite and a leukocyte esterase. So the nitrite, is usually useful for organisms of the class of Enterobacteriaceae because they tend to reduce nitrate. So because they reduce nitrate, the nitrate test in urine would be positive if at all the dipsticks are used. The leukocyte esterase is based upon uh, the presence of uh, neutrophils in the uh, urine. So any urinary tract infection can be positive. And uh, per se, these are tests which are very specific. That is, if at all they are positive, then you can be more sure that there is a urinary tract infection. However, the sensitivity is only around 80%. That means it can miss uh, uh, out of 100 patients with a UTI, around 20, 20 patients may not have a district positivity. This has to be remembered. And uh, apart from this, contamination while collecting urine, presence of uh, blood, and uh, the presence of WBC in other conditions like glomerulonephritis or even in malignancy can cause a false positivity. So this has to be remembered when we are interpreting a urine analysis. So what are the other things which we will have to see in a urine analysis when we are using a microscope? Would be the presence of bacteria. So whenever there is a bacteria, we can be specific that there is a UK, but it is a very least, least sensitive. You can use a leukocyte esterase and a nitrate by means of dipstick. You can see for the number of WBCs. If the WBC person, uh, number is more than 10, then it is a highly sensitive. Specificity is less because WBCs can be present in all other conditions also, but it is a very sensitive investigation. So these are the things which we look on commonly in urine analysis in the clinical setting. So going on, as you can see, the diagnostic criteria has only bacteriuria. This bacteria concept was given by uh, Cass in 1960, and the categorization or the basic degree it varies. In general, the presence of more than 10 power 5 colony forming units is diagnostic of UTA. In case of male symptomatic UTI, it is 10 power 3 colony forming units. If at all, you're going to use a catheter to collect the sample. So this there is a differentiation. Those who are having a pre-existing catheter, then you still have to have more than 10 power 5 colony forming units. However, if you are just placing a catheter to collect the sample for analysis, then even a 10 power 2 colony forming units would be sufficient. This is a differentiation with regard to the call number of colony forming units required for diagnosis of an UTI. If at all you are going to collect the urine from a suprapubic region directly from the bladder, then any growth is suggestive of significant bacteria. So what do we do in general? So if at all there is symptoms, 
there are no symptoms the culture is positive it becomes a asymptomatic bacteria if there are symptoms we either collect a midstream urine or we can do an in and out catheterization that is we place a catheter collect the sample for urine or in a long term catheter we just see whether the uh, pathogens are there if at all there are no symptoms it is still becomes a symptomatic uti because the patient has had symptoms like dysuria and other things if he is going to have problems in voiding he has some frequency urgency or suprabic pain then it is ulcerosis status they're going to have more systemic features it becomes a pyelonephritis as we have discussed already so apart from this urinary investigation uh, imaging would be required only in more severe cases like the patient is having features as of pyelonephritis then you would require to do a pyelonephritis uh, ultrasound for sure this is because you will have to rule out obstruction if at all the patient does not respond to systemic therapy for at least 2 to 3 days 72 hours then you would require to do even a ct to understand if there are any other complications one or if there are any other predisposing factors apart from this routine urinary tract infections do not require any imaging so going on to the treatment the first part would be asymptomatic uti so asymptomatic uti should be treated only if it happens in a pregnant female because symptomatic asymptomatic uti increases the risk of preterm birth increases the risk of pyelonephritis and birth related complications in a pregnant female so all pregnant females have to be treated even if it is asymptomatic immunosuppressed individuals especially those who undergo renal transplant or undergo some uh, chemotherapy they will have to be treated because they are more prone for the organisms to cause systemic complications especially sepsis so they will have to be treated or if they are being planned for a procedure which is going to breach the urothelium consider that the patient is going to be subjected to a cystoscopy when you are going to place a scope through the uh, urethra the bladder so obviously you are going to damage the urothelium when you are doing the scope the patient so in this case also the risk of infection getting disseminated is more so these are the cases in which asymptomatic bacteria has to be treated so how do you treat it so basically the guidelines they vary i have just taken the guidelines the infectious disease society of america idsa icmr and the aims uh, antimicrobial guidelines in general what is needed is either nitrofurantoin 100 mg twice a day amoxicillin or amoxiclavulinate or cefixib for a period of 3 to 7 days should be required uh, the icmr guidelines does not deal with asymptomatic bacteria per se apart from the antibiotics you will have to ensure that the fluid intake is increased one alkalinizing agents are used and some advocate the use of cranberry juice because it is going to alter the uh, milieu and thereby reduce the risk of recurrent uti however this has not been proven uh, urinary antiseptics can be used which has been dealt with uh, in detail by dr sudesh sir however it should be remembered that the urinary antiseptics can be given only in lower uti for upper end tract infections that is pyelonephritis antiseptics are not of any use uh, how are you going to manage uncomplicated uti uh, symptomatic uncomplicated uti so the first question would be if it is a female patient if the patient is post menopausal or not if the patient is not post menopausal then we will have to see if the patient is pregnant or not if the patient is pregnant nitrofurantoin phosphomycin cefalexin are safe they will have to be given for 7 days if at all the patient is not pregnant does not have a sulfa allergy then ceftron trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole for 3 days would suffice if at all the patient has a sulfa allergy or has a prior history of some failure of sulfa drugs then a quinolone or nitrofurantoin can be used if quinolones are used they have to be used for 3 days whereas nitrofurantoin is used for 7 days in case of post menopausal the duration of therapy is still for 7 days and not 3 days that is the only difference and here again if there is no sulfa allergy ceftron can be used otherwise quinolones or nitrofurantoin can be used so for all post menopausal the treatment is for 7 days sulfa allergy or no sulfa allergy decides the initial therapy and if the patient is pregnant then the duration of therapy is again 7 days these are the main take away points and uh, you should remember that the fluoroquinolones that is ciprofloxacin and leofloxacin are not the first line drugs and uh, they are preferably 
used only a second line drugs in order to prevent the occurrence of resistance in the community. So this is another chart from the IDS in European society. It gives the same thing. Like once you rule out alternate diagnosis, you give either nitrofentoin, sulfa, or phosphomycin. If at all there is any resistance, then fluoroquinolone can be used. This is what is given. So what we should understand is that we need an idea of the local resistance pattern because there are some areas where the fluoroquinolone resistance is high. In these areas, fluoroquinolone should not be used as a part of outpatient. So we should know about the local antibiogram before we can prescribe. Per se, in India, still the resistance for fluoroquinolones is not over 10 percent. That is why we are still using. It. So what we have seen is uncomplicated UTI in females, low urinary tract. For pyelonephritis in non-pregnant females, we can still use septron uh, or quinolones. If at all, the general recommendation is less. However, the duration of therapy is for seven days. That is what has to be remembered. It is not for three days, but for seven days. If at all the patient is sick and requires hospitalization, then we can treat the patient with either quinolones or ceftriaxone, aminoglycosides, or with penums, imipenums. Either of these can be used. And we start with either intravenous therapy. And once the patient responds to therapy, after 48 to 72 hours, if the patient has responded well to therapy, this can be shifted to an oral regimen. If at all the response is inadequate, the intravenous regimen can be continued for 7 to 14 days. Or else, if they are sufficient, you can shift off to oral regimen for another 7 days. This is what is the general guideline for an admitted patient with pyelonephritis. This is what is for the female patients. Regarding male patients, almost all male patients, all, all male UTIs are uh, complicated UTIs. And uh, they are usually present with uh, fever and other manifestations. The AIMS guidelines recommends that we use the quinolone. Ciprofox or Leoflox has to be used for a period of, depending upon the involvement, up to six weeks also. This is because frequently in male UTIs, prostate involvement is common. Prostatitis. And whenever there is prostatitis, the duration of therapy should be for at least two to four weeks. This is the minimum. And if at all the patient has recurrent prostatitis or chronic prostatitis, the therapy has to extend even for 6 to 12 weeks. An alternative to quinolones in those who are allergic could be again the sulfur drugs. They are safe and they can be used. They do penetrate the prostate. Here again, the duration of therapy is for a longer duration, around 12 weeks. There's a difference with regard to a male versus a female UTI. So these are the common antibiotics which we are using on a day-to-day -day basis at present. However, uh, with the extensive use of antibiotics, the resistance has gone up. The microorganisms tend to evade the antibiotics by producing beta lactamases. We have the expend, extended spectrum beta lactamases now. We have carbapenase now. We have the metal of beta lactamase, including the deli one now. You have a carbapenum resistant enterococcus right now. All these require newer antibiotics to be used. A number of antibiotics are being developed right now. So, what is a number of agents I have listed? like cefidorocol, ceftalozolum, tazobactam, astrionam, avibactam, imipenum, relibactam, plasomycin, which is a newer aminoglycoside. All these drugs are in studies right now, and it is a, some time before they are also used. With the indiscriminate use of antibiotics, what we are doing in the community, especially in the developing countries, the antibiotic resistance has increased, and we may have to use these newer agents in the future. And there may be at times when we may not have any antibiotics. So that is why a rational use, the so-called antibiotic stewardship has to be proved. So apart from this, the other class of adjunct therapy would be the urinary analgesics. It is not advocated by FDA. As the name suggests, they are analgesics. They just reduce the discomfort the patients have. Can be used for a short-term therapy in those with a near normal renal function. However, uh, phenazopyridine can cause methemoglobinemia in predisposed individuals. That has to be remembered. That is one. And two, if they are used early in the course, it will mask the clinical symptoms. A patient may feel better. They may not come for follow-up. And then they may just directly present with a complicated UTI or with sepsis. So it can mask the clinical symptoms. This has to be remembered. So having seen how we are going to manage in the outpatient basis, when would you admit a patient with pyelonephritis? Especially if they are going to have comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, renal failure, liver disease. You should admit them. 
if they are pregnant and pyelonephritis is there, it should be admitted. If they're not able to take low, orally, they have high-grade fever or their hemodynamic unstable, then they need to get admitted. If at all, they developed a renal dysfunction, that is an acute kidney injury, after an urinary tract infection also, they need to get admitted and receive antibiotic therapy. Uh, why is that a concern about UTA? One, uh, it can be recurrent if you're not going to treat it. The UTA can ascend to the kidneys and cause permanent kidney damage, resulting in chronic kidney disease, and these patients may require dialysis in the future. So that has to be remembered. In pregnant females, the risk of uh, preterm deliveries and low birth weight deliveries are increased. And with recurrent urethritis, patients can develop urethral narrowing and strictures. This can predispose for further UTA. It can spread to the bloodstream, causing urosepsis. Because of all this, we are concerned. Obviously, you ask the patients to drink more water, avoid unnecessary uh, douching sprays in their genital area. And from the younger age group itself, potty training has to be given properly to the children. This is the only way we are going to prevent it. So this is with regard to the general UTA, what we have seen. Another class of UTA is the catheter-associated UTA. And if the patient is going to develop it with an catheter or within 48 hours of removal of catheter, we diagnose a catheter-associated UTA. So if the patient is having a symptom, we send the urine for culture. If there are more than 10 power 5 colony forming units, not more than two microorganisms, we diagnose a catheter-associated UTA. As you can see, the definition is slightly different in IDSA. Practically speaking, if the patient is symptomatic and it is more than 10 power 3, we still treat at each. So that's a practical thing which we follow. Probably the IDSA guidelines are more practical with regard to this. With regard to the therapy, based upon the local antibiotic biogram, about which antibiotics are more effective in the local scenario, they have to be used for 14 days. Aims, what we use would be either imipenum or the meropenum. And at times, piprazin and tazobactam or magnamycin maybe are the agents which we are preferring for a complicated UTA or catheterization UTA. So how do we prevent catheterization UTA? Catheterization is very much common. Patients who are intubated, patients who can't take care of themselves, patients with urinary tract issues, patients who are sick, they tend to get catheterized in hospital. So we can't prevent catheterization, but we can minimize its use as much as possible. We can make sure that only those who require it get the catheter. And if at all they are on the catheter, we'll have to remove it as much as, as early as possible. That is one. And before placing, we should ensure adequate hygiene. And uh, we should make sure that the right, correct size is used and unnecessary and they are properly secured. Because if they are not secure, a constant movement of the catheter up and down the urinary tract can damage the epithelium. And this can also increase the risk of uh, urinary tract infections. And if at all there is a break in the aseptic technique of placing a connector catheter or there's a disconnection between the catheter tube and the police bag, we'll have to immediately replace the catheter with a septic precaution being we should avoid kinking because whenever there is a kinking of the catheter, so above the kinking, you're going to have, have collection of urine, which can increase the risk of infection. So all these have to be prevented. One easy thing would be to remember would be the corti bundle, catheter uh, UTA bundle. So you will have to remove the catheter as and when it is not needed. So you'll have to reassess every day if there is a need for the catheter or not. Ensure that there is asepsis. So Proper aseptic precautions while inserting the catheter one, and it should be inserted only by trained individuals. That has to be remembered. The smallest possible size has to be used because the larger size is going to damage the lining of the urinary tract. You regularly assess how is the tract, how is the bladder, are there any alternatives to the uh, catheter. You train both the staff, the patient, and the patient's family about how to maintain hygiene and uh, how to do routine investigations. And uh, I would be that you make sure that there is a proper care planning is done, the time voiding is done, and you remove the catheter on time properly. These things have to be maintained for all patients with a catheter. So I, UTI is a common health concern, both in the community and in the hospital setting. It's very common, probably the most common hospital-acquired infection. All cases of male UTIs are complicated. Whenever you're suspecting a UTI, Urinary collection technique should be proper. You will have to teach the patient about how they should collect urine. Then only they'll be able to collect it properly. 
Treatment guidelines vary according to the place and uh, the local antibiotic pattern, sensitivity pattern is very important to know about the management. Prevention is always better than cure. Try to prevent the use of catheters. Try to uh, teach them about good uh, sanitization techniques so that UTA does not happen. That has to be told to all uh, pregnant patients as well as those with recurrent UTAs, diabetics, and those who are admitted. With the risk of overt use of antibiotics, the risk of resistance is very high. The presence or the role of newer antibiotics is a way of hope, and hopefully, they should work better and to prevent complications in UTA. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. Uh, I Any think question? Uh, question from this. Okay, so I think um, you are quite aware of um, the antibiotics to be used in case of urinary tract infections and which antibiotics are commonly being prescribed by the general practitioners, but nowadays you should be cautious that chloroquinolones should be used sparingly. It is showing too much resistance patterns in number of areas. You should be aware that it should not be used as a offline drug or as a fast choice of drug in case of UTI, okay? And, uh, okay, so we'll see the other antibiotics later on like aminoglycosides and chloroquinolones, then you should be aware that where they are used preferably. So thank you for your patience. Uh, so we can end the class now.